Good morning. Today's date is October 18th, 2006. My name is Thomas Murray. Today I'm conducting an oral history interview with Homer Ouellette. This interview is being held at the Dalton Community Television Studio in Dalton, Massachusetts, in association with the Dalton Council on Aging. Good morning, Homer. Good morning. Uh, could you give us uh, your name and spell your last name, full name and spell your last name, please? Uh, Homer Lawrence Willett. That's uh, with, a, with a no, not a W. It's O-U-E-L-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. And where do you presently live, Homer? Pittsfield, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Okay. And what is your date of birth and where were you born? March 18th, 1926. And I was born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, did you grow up and go to school there? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what schools did you go to? Do you remember? Uh, grammar school was Mercer School. Mm -hmm. The next, then uh, Central Junior High School. That's not a common, it's now a, a home. And uh, Pittsfield High School was. And uh, do you have any teachers that you remember? Oh, uh, do I? Taking? John Patrick Leahy. John was a head of the science department for the school, and he got a, took a liking to me and let me be his lab assistant. So as a matter of fact, I never had a home room. I'd always go right directly to his lab and set up the experiments for him and ran a projector and all that. Mm -hmm. But after school, well, after I come out of the Korean War, he, uh, the two of us got together, and he was a great fisherman. We fished for hours. Every day I'd, we'd go out fishing, fly fishing, and he was very, very gregarious. So we'd walk down the middle of the stream, him on the right, I'm on the left. I'm left-handed, so it was perfect. We'd fish and talk. Yep. So Pat, yep. he fished around the bend. He's gone now, mm -hmm. but always, always remembered him. Well, that's yep. good. That's nice to have someone yep. like so, that. Uh, what was it like growing up at that time? Uh, it was during the Depression, but I was one of the lucky ones. My dad worked during the Depression for General Electric, so we weren't, you know, suffering really, really poor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, things were really tough, you know. The, uh, you wore hand-me-downs and, of course, never owned a house, never owned a car, but l life was good. Mm -hmm. And as far as having no money, nobody had any, had any anyway, so it made no difference to us. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Did you have any uh, brothers and sisters? Do you have any brothers? Yes, I have a, uh, before, well, the parents were married, and then two years after they got married, they had my brother. Two years after that, my sister, Anne, my brother Paul, sister Anne, then me, and then 11 years after that, my kid sister Jean, mm -hmm. and my oldest sister is gone now. Mm -hmm. She died a few years ago. And what did your dad do for a living? Dad was a foreman. He ended up as a foreman in the uh, General Electric and a foreman in the copper department. So he started out in uh, Lindenville, Vermont, is where he was actually born. And Lindenville had a, it's a junction for the CPR railroad, and they had a roundhouse where the engines would come and they repair, and he worked the machine shop there. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems as though they went on strike, never settled a strike, they just left. So my father was out of job, so he went to Newport, Rhode Island, and he worked in the torpedo station down there making torpedoes. And my mother lived in Newport, Rhode Island, of course, and she was an inspector at Newport, Rhode Island, and that's how the two of them met. So after they met, married, they moved back to Lindenville for just a small time, and he was looking for a job and then he went to General Electric, got a mm -hmm. job. So. Uh, what did he do in, uh, I, I know it was kind of important, that he did in uh, New London, or it, Newport? Newport, Newport, I'm sorry. It, it, they, he, made, he was a machinist, and they made torpedoes mm -hmm. for the real, well, for World War I is what they were for. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my mother was an inspector, and that's what they made as torpedoes. Mm -hmm. It used to be an island, Torpedo Station was on an island. Now the island is connected to the, the at Newport. It's connected to the shore. Yeah. Still there. Well, was he a veteran? Was your dad a no, veteran? No, no. Uh, during he was too old for World War Two, but World War One, he was apparently in a strategic position, so they left him right there. 
Now, you said you went to Pittsville High. Did you graduate? Uh, uh, yes, I graduated, but not formal graduation. I went into service before the days of the graduation, so I never had the experience of going to a prom or any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was after the war, I went down to high school and picked up my diploma. So it was still a valid diploma yeah. in the, you know, high school education. Now, you also mentioned that during that, your senior year, that uh, you kind of had a split. Uh, you worked a little bit. And, uh... Yes, during World War II, apparently if you, had, if you were a warm body, you could find a job because they needed people because most of the guys were out in the service. So I had enough points to graduate. So they allowed you to go to, I worked, I, I went to school until about noon. Then I go to work, and I worked in the plastics over here. In the, su in the summertime, I worked full time at the plastics. In, then when I went back to school, I worked there. And then Pat, John Patrick Leahy got me a job in the laboratory. And the laboratory is still there, but it's part of that complex, the plastics. Mm -hmm. And I worked in there for quite a while until I, got, uh, until I went to service. Mm -hmm. so, and what year was that? That was 1942 and 43. Mm -hmm. Now, were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, a little bit of both, I think. <laughs> I, uh, my mother always wanted a sailor. I always had the feeling she wanted a sailor in the family because she'd come from Newport. And Newport was just a real Navy town. And my brother had been al already in the service in, in the Air Force. So I joined the Navy. So after I joined the Navy, because you could, they sent us to uh, St. Charles Hotel in Springfield, which was kind of a kind of a flea bag, little rundown hotel. Put us up for the night, not in rooms, but in one great big room. They had cots. We slept on the cots. Next morning they fed us a breakfast, and it was a uh, where they checked you out to find out if you you could get into service. All the rooms had different doctors in each room in whatever their specialty was. So you start out, one end of the hall with your newspaper, your, all your papers under your arm, stark naked, just follow the line into one room, get checked out for your eyes, out into the next room, just on and on down. Finally, they came to one spot. It was a cardiologist, cardiologist, I guess. Anyway, you walk in and he'd, as the guys walked by the doctor, he'd listen to their heart, next, next, next guy come up, next. And when he came to me, put his stethoscope there and he listened and his face kind of scrunched up. Look, his eyes squinted up and, I just, and by this time I, I, I know something's wrong and I'm starting to sweat. He says, go over the corner there and stand and jump up and down. So I did that, and next, 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 pretty soon he said, come over here. So I go over here and he checked again. He takes a stamp, and he takes my papers out of my hand, he takes a stamp, and he stamps the papers, and I look at it, 4F, which was the designation of, you know, unfit for military mm -hmm. service. So back to the head of the line, sent me back home. And when I got back home, I'm walking back home. I can remember walking down Tyler Street. We lived on Grove Street, tears in my eyes, you know, for... I don't know whether it was because I couldn't get into service or the humility I was, thought I was going to face mm -hmm. not being allowed in the service. Mm -hmm. So uh, I figured by this time my draft number had come up. And when you had a draft number, you could go for what they call immediate induction. This is in, so you just volunteer to go in as a draftee in the, uh, upside to that was you could pick your own service. Mm -hmm. So I picked the Navy. Same thing, went down there, sent me to St. Charles Hotel, same hotel, same rooms, same meal. I, I don't know if it was the same doctor or not, but when I got to him, the doctor says, next, listen. I stepped up, listen, next, next. I was in. I remember filling out the form. On the form there was something about, have you ever been refused for military service? And I just checked no. So, so I got in. It, what, ultimately, what it was was a heart murmur, and I still have it. I've had it for, well, 80 years. So, so uh, now you, you mentioned you never went back home after that physical. You no, went, no, you, you went right to, 
right, right to uh, Sampson, New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how so, old were you at that time? Uh, I think I was just a little over 18. Yes. That was March. It was in May. I, I believe it was in May. Okay, so yeah. a couple months over 18. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your dates of service? Uh, uh, no, not really. Uh, we looked so, at, it was uh, May 16th, 44. Would that, okay, yep. Yeah, that yep. was uh, to March uh, 46. That was uh, that, World War II. Right, that was World War II. And then you joined yeah. the reserves in 48, was that? 48. Mm -hmm. And then you were called up uh, for 50, the uh, Korean 50, War. 52, I think I was. 50 to 53, was that right? 1950 to 53. Okay, yeah, that sounds right. And uh, why did, you kind of mentioned it, but why did you choose the branch of service you went into? Because of my mother, believe it or not. Yeah. 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 And she never said it. But I just had the feeling she yeah. wanted the Navy. Yeah. And of course, when in the Navy, the ride is rough. But you get three square meals, and you get a nice bed to lay in. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that was a reason, but that ultimately I found out yeah. it's a good reason to be in the Navy. And where did you go to boot camp? Sampson, New York, in, in Geneva, New York, mm -hmm. out in one of the uh, Finger Lakes. So um, you mentioned a couple of experiences you had in boot camp. What were those? Um, the oh, there was KP duty or <laughs> oh yeah, KP duty. It seems of a, uh, the worst company upon graduation, the week before graduation, the worst company in the whole, I forget what they called it. It wasn't a battalion, but uh, the worst company had the dubious honor of having KP. So, and we call it mess cooking. The army calls it KP. So, they lined us up. The cook lined everybody up in the mess hall and went down the line and was assigning different jobs and he finally says, okay, he says, I need two volunteers for the worst job in the place. And he started looking down a row and he got to me and I made the ultimate mistake of just pulling my head back a little bit. He, so I walk up and he signed everybody else and he come up to me and this other guy because we're going to work in shifts. He says, tell you the truth, he says, you got the best job there is. And it was in the garbage room. And the garbage room was a room, oh, not much bigger than a studio. One end of it had a huge, huge refrigerator. And a concrete floor, it all sloped down to a drain. And every day as the garbage come in, there'd be 55, well, there were big, big garbage cans full of garbage. And they had to be separated. So I'd check them out. And say, okay, if this was meat, you go in a flea, and this was veggies, and this mashed potatoes, whatever it was. I'd, in, in the chief told me, if it is not separated, don't accept it. One day I opened it up and it wasn't accepted, so I got the guy that brought it in. Of course, who am I to tell him, dump it, you know? So the guy said, ah, leave it, you take care of it. So I told the chief. The chief went out and got the guy and he brought him in. He took that thing, he dumped it right on the floor and told the guy, now you sit there and separate it. So he, the, the chief asked me before, the chief cook there, he said, you like milk? I said, yeah, okay. So part of the job was they had these 100-pound milk cans, and you'd have to wash them, scour them out, clean them up good, and send them back. One day he sends the milk cans in. I open one of them up, and it's full right to the brim with milk. So I told him, I said, you know, they sent me a whole 100 pounds of milk. He said, I thought you said you liked milk. I said, I do. Drink it. <laughs> so I had, that was really a good job, though. Yeah. So, but, then there was another story uh, where you were taking your tests. You oh, at when you were during the, uh, at one point there, you take a battery of tests. It was about three three days of testing, and they harped on us and they harped on us that whatever you do, take these tests serious. Try your very best because that the marks you're going to get are going to haunt you for the rest of your Navy career. And they said in way back then. With, with the first time that they started using electronic machines to correct them. So they used to stress out the point. Now these tests, when you take them, the mark you get is the true mark because they're tested by machines. There's no mistake. So what you get, that's, that's your mark. So whatever you do, do good. So come time, I took the test and finally we went down and they gave us a slip of paper, had all the marks on it. <coughs> went in this room and there's a 
guy sitting there and you'd sit down and what they'd do is they'd look at your test and determine which kind of a school you're eligible for. So the guy sat and he looked at mine and he looked at it and he, all of a sudden he says, something is drastically wrong with this. And he says, in every category, and there was categories like math and reading, understanding, and all of English, and so he says, in every one of these categories, you're in the upper 7% of the Navy, except one. In this one, you're one step above a moron. He says, gotta be a mistake. So he says, here, take this back and tell them they made a mistake. And here I am, there, everybody, in the, everybody there but the recruits is a, like an admiral. You know, if a guy had a stripe on his sleeve, whoo, you know, so I'm scared to go back. I, so I finally went back with my tail between my legs and I figured, geez, how am I gonna present, tell these people, they just told me these tests are correct. So I'm scared enough to go back. So finally I went back and fortunately I got a, a nice guy and he looked at it and he, wow, he said, this can't be. So they checked and ultimately the answer was whoever took the mark off the machine and wrote it on a piece of paper, made the mistake. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in good shape. So, so uh, what type of training did you get at Bullfield? Oh, they had lots of, lots of marching. First day there, after they give you your clothes, they give you your shoes, and you, you get dressed, put your shoes on, put rubbers on. I said, well, why do we have to wear rubbers? So he marched us at a barracks wearing the rubbers. All day long, we marched with the rubbers on. Next day, they march us to the cobbler. You sat there, and they took the rubbers off. You took your shoes, and they put another sole on your shoe, and that sole was a good quarter of an inch thick. And then from then on, those are the shoes you marched in. When we left, went back to the cobblers, and they ripped that sole off, what was left of it, and there wasn't much left, and we were right down to the shoe. So there was a lots of marching, close order drill, uh, swimming, how to, you know, jump in, how to jump from a high tower, simulating if a ship was going to sink, you know, you, you, uh, jump from a high tower into the water, swim around, how to swim in case there's oil on the, uh, on the water, protocol, uh, you know, salute, the uh, knots, uh, night vision, gunnery, you name it, and we had it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, obstacle course, so it was very, very extensive. Mm -hmm. In eh, fun, it, oh, in dentistry, a lot of that. You know, they they fix your teeth up, you know, hundred percent when you. So, uh, was it hard for you to adjust to that life? The no, not really, not really. I, I, I've always been in the Boy Scouts, and uh, you know, I was physically fit or anything, so mm -hmm. didn't, didn't really. I fit right in fairly fairly well. Do you remember any of your instructors from back then? Nope, none. No. Not a one of them. Nope. And Just how long was boot camp? Do you remember that? It, pretty, it was 12 to 13 weeks. I think it was about 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, do you remember the graduation at all, the day you graduate? Not a bit. Not a bit. Nope. Also, I have a picture, you know, but that's all. Company 344, I think it was, but I don't remember the graduation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did you get a leave or furlough after you left? Uh, yes, basically? Yeah, we had about a week. Yeah, we, so it was... How was it like coming home in your uniform? Were you? Oh, big shot. I felt proud, you know, walking down the street, especially having, having being a previous 4F guy. It was great, so... But, most, of course, most of my buddies were in the service then, too, so I didn't see them, but... Mm -hmm. oh. But it still made you feel... Oh, yes, yes. Good. Yeah. It was good. One nice thing about being in a, in a uniform, you could go to any restaurant, any, you could go anywhere with the uniform and you're accepted. You know, like if you went to a fancy restaurant, that uniform fit the course, it was mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. I did learn something at boot camp that stuck with me though, my whole life. Never realized it before, but I learned how to judge a man by the man, not the clothes, because everybody wore the same thing. Everybody, and every day you get up in the same clothes, the same type of clothes, mm -hmm. and you learn, you, did, you could look across, say, the, the drill field and see a, one of your buddies, and you recognize him for, by his motions and stuff, not by his clothes. 
And after a while, you never judge people by what they're wearing. You judge a person for who's inside their clothes. And mm -hmm. it stuck with me all my life, yeah. that lesson. Uh, where did you report to next? Uh, from there, they sent us to, uh, they made me a radar man. So I went to the Cavalier Hotel in Little Creek, Virginia. The Cavalier Hotel was a oh, four-star hotel at the time. And the only floor they left intact was one of the floor and the waves were there. And we, and the waves were uh, working there. The first week there, we were only there for about three weeks, but the first week we stayed in a little building in the back and we slept in hammocks. And for that one week, I slept in a hammock. And that's the last time, and that, that's a horrible experience. You can't roll over, you gotta sleep on your back. So, now they mentioned that it was, uh, the, you were told anyways that they were all slave quarters. That yes, yeah. and I didn't realize the building was that old, but the, the building we were in looked that old. Mm -hmm. It was just a little low shack kind of a building. They said that's what originally was before that hotel, whatever the estate was there, that was the slave quarters. Mm -hmm. But so uh, about yeah. how long was your radar school? Did you? It was about three weeks long. Of course, at that time, Radar wasn't as advanced as it is now. So uh, we learned how to repair them, how to operate them, how to take the data and put it on charts to determine the well, course and speed of ships mm -hmm. and how to find a course to intercept the ship. That's the kind of things we learned. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, where did you go to the, after that? From there, we went to Little Creek, Virginia, which was not too far from Virginia Beach, right around the corner from it, and that's an amphibious training base. And it still is a base for mm -hmm. amphibious training. And there is, that's where I learned we were gonna be on an LSM, which was the landing ship medium. Kind of like a, <clears throat> when you say a landing ship, everybody thinks of the LST, because there was a lot of LSTs. An LST had a cover on her tank well, and it was much bigger. An LSM, if you picture a shoebox with a tomato can on one side, that's about what it looked like. Mm -hmm. We had the bow doors and the ramp, but there was no cover on the tank well, so everything was exposed. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, we had calisthenics, naturally, and most of it was teaching us how to you know, run the ship. And we actually went out to sea you know, a few times back and forth and made beach landings and so on. Uh, we stayed there, oh, probably, I don't know, a couple of months mm -hmm. at Little Creek. And so, where did you go after you got out of school? Well, from Little Creek, we went to Houston, Texas. They shipped us, and that's where we were supposed to pick up our LSM. And our LSM was made in Brown Shipyard in Houston. And so we stayed there long enough to get a crew together. From there, they sent us to Galveston, Texas, and shipyard workers must have br brought the ship down to Gal Galveston, which is right down the river, and that's when we oh, spent a couple of weeks on sea trials, taking the ship out, making sure it was seaworthy, and training us, and more, more for the ship, make sure all equipment worked properly, mm -hmm. so. And then uh, from Galveston, you went well. Where? It, it, uh, New Orleans, we, picked, we took the ship to New Orleans, and there we loaded with, uh, there were pipe, pipes for a harbor dredge. And if you picture uh, the dredge itself, we didn't see the dredge itself was a ship contained all by itself. We carried pipes, which were the equivalent of a, the hose on a vacuum cleaner, mm -hmm. and these were big. Our ship carried, I think we had five of them, that's all. And they had to be eight feet in diameter in the length of the tank well. And of course all the LSMs, some of them had pipes and some of them had nozzles at the end of it. And <clears throat> we left, we left uh, New Orleans through the Panama Canal up the west coast to uh, Terminal Island. Terminal Island was a, uh, a Navy base. Mm -hmm. That's where we fueled provisions. And uh, you got provisions and then 
left for uh, uh, we Oregon. left for Pearl Harbor for the Pacific. We mm -hmm. went to Pearl Harbor. You stay at Pearl Harbor just long enough to fuel. I don't even remember getting a Liberty. Yes, we did. We did get a Liberty there. In went into town, come back on, and then from there we went out the right out to the Pacific, mm -hmm. and we went. It was either Saipan or Tinian in the Marshall Islands or the Marianas and offloaded these pipes. So we never did see the dredge itself. Mm -hmm. And I know you can't remember the sequence, but you did a lot of uh, transporting after that, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, while well, you were... I always said we were uh, oh, kind of like the Mullen Mayflower of the Pacific. We were all over the place. We went to all the different islands. The first one, f right from Tinian, we went right to Leyte Gulf in, in, in the Philippines. And from Leyte Gulf, we went down to Guadalcanal. And we picked up uh, Fifth Air Force, I think it was. And they loaded a lot of the equipment there. And we delivered it to another island. Mm -hmm. I think we delivered it up back to Saipan back down to the Philippines, and we run around in the Philippines for, oh, for months, back and forth, you know, one island to another island. So we had a lot of experiences there. One of them was, <coughs> because our ship was, had two screws, two propellers, if you will, and it was powerful, you know, there was enough to pull you back off the beach mm -hmm. with the aid of the anchor, but because we, had, we were kind of powerful, we were told that there was a Japanese concrete barge adrift out in the Pacific and told us to go out and get it. So in concrete barge, we never heard anything of the, you know, how can your concrete float? But then we think, hey, we're in a steel ship and we're wondering about concrete. Anyway, we went out there, towed up, we found the barge, towed, hooked, you know, fastened to it, towed it in, and we but the second day we went, I wonder what's on board that thing. So we got the small boat, went over to check, and it was loaded to the gunnels, right to the top with beer, Japanese beer. So needless to say, we, we took all we could get, but the skipper found out about it naturally. So he made us put everything back except two cases, or two or three cases per man. But he controlled them. He put them in some locker and locked them up. But every time we went into a port and we hit, went ashore, we could have a couple of cans of beer. So it made it kind of a little unusual. You know, we were kind of sick of drinking Coca-Cola. <laughs> so. Now, you also mentioned you picked up some prisoners uh, one Yeah, time. somewhere along the line, we went up to uh, Mindanao. And from Mindanao, we went over to Zamboango. In the monkeys, I know. <laughs> You know, some monkeys have no tails in Zamboanga. I never saw a monkey there, but I did see the Japanese. We picked up about 10 prisoners and brought them right back to Mindanao, dropped them off there, and we went to oh, many, many other islands. And back and forth, here and there, we'd go up to... Uh, one time we, we picked up a load of clothing. It was, it was a U.S. Army clothing and that we loaded on a tank well and it covered up on a huge tarp. And it was funny because you'd look down at that tarp and you'd see it bouncing around, you know, guys underneath it, you know. And they'd open the bags up and they had shoes and jackets, so everybody got their share of jackets. But, so pilfering was, always went on in the service. You're always pilfering from the other guys, you know. Now you had a couple stories while you were on ship, but one was, uh, playing cards oh. at, at night. When you, in, when you sail in, in, during the war, there was never any running lights. The ship was always dark. That's one of the purposes of the radar, to maintain, maintain station. So being dark all the time, if you were to be inside in bright white light, and you walk outside, uh, you can't see, your, your eyes have got to adjust, and it takes a good 45 minutes for your eyes to really adjust. So to counter that, counter that, the Navy has you set up, there's red lights in the ship. So in, there's a, a mechanism on a door. When you open the door up, if you have white lights, the lights will go out. You step outside and shut, shut the hatch. But the red lights, it doesn't do that. You, you know, you turn them off so you can go right outside, inside. So one night we were sitting, we were, 
And the only time those red lights are used is when you're in a, in a hot zone. So we're in a hot zone one time. We sat down to play cards. We deal the cards. One of the guys picks up the cards. He says, hey, who's the joker? He says, there's no, nothing on these cards. Well, it seems so the red light in the ship was the exact shade of the cards. And here you're looking at a ten of diamonds, and there's nothing on it. It's the whole thing. So we had to take a pen in all our deck. And we used to play triple pinnacle. We played triple deck pinnacle and double deck pinnacle. Take in a, with a pen, mark every single heart, every single. <laughs> so. So you can I, play at night. I told that story a couple of times, and somebody told me that they do have cards now that are marked, you know, yeah. so you can see the cards. It was kind of unique. And another story you had was uh, you saw the hospital ship. Well, we're, one night the skipper called from the bridge, and he says, the radar, and I said, the radar eye, he you want to see a beautiful sight? I said, sure. He said, well, look out the porthole. So when I looked out the porthole, here's a, on the horizon out there was this glow coming. Well, you know, at night, you never saw anything except the stars in the fluorescence in the ocean in the wake. Uh, and this big ship is coming, and it was huge. Pure white, right down the side, a big red stripe with another big red cross on it. And out of the, off the gunnels, both sides were these booms sticking out with a great big, big spotlights on it, all lit pointing back to the ship. So this thing was lit up like a Christmas tree. And it was, the, it was either the USS Hope or the USS Mercy. It was a hospital ship. Mm -hmm. And the thing went sailing by us. And, you know, it was so spectacular. And needless to say, uh, I don't know about the rest of the crew. I said a prayer for the poor guys who were on board ship. Sure. That, yeah. Not the crew, but the passengers. They were, you know, all the wounded were on board. So right. that was quite a sight. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you got prepared for the invasion of Okinawa. Uh, what was your task in that one? Well, we went up to Aishima, and we picked up, I think it was the 2nd Marine Division, and we picked up five tanks. We loaded them on, on the ship, and then we went to, we were destined to go to Okinawa, and we were in Task Force 34, and it was a uh, diversionary tactics for us. What they did is they put us on the back side of the island, and our orders were to make a landing. If there was no resistance, make the landing. If there was resistance, pull away from the beach. And the purpose of that was to draw any Japanese from the, the main assault, draw them on that side to relieve the pressure on their side. So that first morning, of course, the first morning, typical Navy, Anytime you go into battle, it's steak and eggs for breakfast. So we had our steak and eggs, and off we went to the beach. And there was resistance, so they weren't going to land. So what they did is we got just within sight of the beach where it looked like we were going to land. All the ships were lined up. And one of our planes come down, a couple of planes come down and laid a smoke screen. And during that smoke screen, we all turned around and went back over the horizon. And the smoke screen cleared. Of course, now the... They did relieve the pressure from the other side. And we did that for a couple of days. And then never did land. We just, the, on the, I think it was the third day, we kept going. We went back to Saipan. And the Marines on board, they were really glad because they were experienced Marines. They had been in battle before, and they didn't want another one. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a relief to the, those guys. We brought them back to Saipan, offloaded them. So Now, while you were at Okinawa, you mentioned you did uh, see the kamikazes and you fired? Uh, oh, def you definitely. There was a, uh, <clears throat> one thing, we, well, we, there was a lot of kamikazes. And no, I've never seen so many planes in the sky. At my, but the sky was just loaded with planes and flak. And our orders were uh, just each one of the guns on board our ship was told, they were given a spot to shoot at, shoot in. They worked to shoot at the planes themselves, just fill that spot, umbrella coverage, they called it. They fill that spot of air, so our ship was literally covered with bullets going up, and planes would fly through it. That was the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also, before we went, when we were in Saipan to pick up the, the tanks, they came aboard, and we had 50 caliber 
guns on, on board. In between all of the big guns, like the, the 20 millimeters and 40 millimeters, they put 50 calibers. Well, they came and they revamped the 50 calibers so that they would shoot directly off the ship, not out. And the purpose of that was they suspected there was going to be camel, kamikaze boats, small boats loaded. So they wanted the, the machine guns to be able to shoot right straight down. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there was none of them. But the, 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 it's the one time I was glad I was on a small ship because the kamikazes were not after us. There was bigger targets. But that's not to say one of them could have taken us, mm -hmm. you know, if, if say, it was running out of fuel or something. But it, they were going over our head and, and hitting other ships. Mm -hmm. So there was a couple of ships we saw, you know, on fire. And so it's not a pleasant experience when you don't care to go through it right. again. Right. So from there you went uh, back to Saipan. You took the tanks yep. and the... And continued our business uh, back down to the Philippines, eventually back to Okinawa. I think we went back to Okinawa twice after it was secured. Mm -hmm. A couple of times we went back to Okinawa and uh, delivered all kinds of things. We delivered a lot mm -hmm. of trucks. We do a lot of trucks and a lot of Jeeps. And uh, one, one of them, I think we had, I don't know how many Jeeps on board. So we had about 20 Jeeps. Of course, we delivered 19 of them. <laughs> one of them miraculously stayed aboard ship. So, of course, that wasn't, the skipper was using that Jeep, so. Now, uh, you had a story, too, about the, your screw got bent, one of the screws on the. Oh, what, oh, one of the ports we went into, apparently, the, one of the propellers got bent. It got oh, a big chip in it, not a chip, but the actually bent. So they brought us to a dry dock. It wasn't a dry dock, they brought us to a, a repair station that had a dry dock, we didn't go in. They just tied us alongside, and on the screw, they took a, a huge nut off. They took that off. Divers went down to do it. Mm -hmm. And then to get the screw off, between the ship and the screw, where the shaft come out, they wrapped dynamite around it. And then we stayed aboard the ship and everything. They didn't, and they touched it off. And a whole back end of the ship just rolled, boom, come right out of the water, blew the screw off put another one on, the nut back on, off we went. So it was quite a way to make a repair. Yeah, yeah. So uh, after the bombs, the atomic bombs were dropped, uh, what was your assignment then? Uh, September 1st was to be, yeah, it was the September 1st, was to be a, the invasion of Japan, the actual invasion. Thank God Harry Truman dropped that bomb because then the, then the war, well, then another, the second one on Nagasaki and the war was declared over. Well, we were told of, they, were, they continued right on with that invasion plans. And if it hadn't been for Harry dropping that bomb, I wouldn't have been here talking to you. It, it's a foregone conclusion I would have been gone, it, me and the whole ship. And the reason I say that is the spot they picked for us to go was Wacomo, Japan, and it was a, uh, we were told, you know, continue with the invasion, just don't pull a trigger. We had guns loaded and everything, but don't pull any triggers. So the spot they picked us for us was so probably a mile wide, not quite a mile wide, but you could see both sides. And it, it rose right up out of the sea, and you could see gun emplacements all the way down. It was a long, long, long channel, and at the end of the channel there was an airplane, a, a seaplane base. So we went down that channel, and we had minesweepers head, and the mines were floating by, and they were taking joy in shooting them. If they'd hit one of them, you know, it hit the right spot, the thing would explode. So we finally got to the end, and when the ships landed, uh, what, what we did is 150 yards out, I would tell a skipper that we were there, and he'd drop the anchor, and then they'd just let the anchor free, free spool, hit the beach, and what they didn't know, the intelligence never told them that, that the Japanese had concrete ramp from the seaplane base right out into the ocean. So when we hit that ramp, of course, I, I'm inside. I can't see it, but I could tell something was wrong because normally when you hit the beach, you hit sand, and there's a sound as, you know, you kind of slide up. 
In this, it just I could feel a ship just sailing. And we come right up out of the water, and it was 16 LSMs all lined up in a row, and the screws are churning the air right out of the water. And sit, we were sitting ducks. If we'd have made it that far, we'd have been absolute sitting ducks. And it took, oh, I think we were there for about two and a half weeks, waiting for the highest tide to come along so the water would come up high enough. And then they got bulldozers to push each ship back into the water in spite of the fact we had the anchor trying to pull us out. So, but the skipper, he figured, hey, we're out of the water and all the barnacles are showing, so give the crew something to do. So we scraped the whole <laughs> ship, all the barnacles off the ship then, so. So uh, this was into October now. Uh, then what did you do after that? Uh, well, uh, scurried around back and forth to islands, and we went back to Jap we went to the different islands, picked up stuff, and brought them back up to, to Japan. I think we made three trips to Japan. One of them, I'm standing on a shore in, in, in Japan, and the little Japanese woman comes up to me in just perfect English. She's, and I know, at least I suspect, somebody told her what to say. She walked up and she looked at me and she said, why did you bomb Nagasaki? She said, took me a step, and I just turned around and I said, why did you bomb Pearl Harbor? I don't know whether she understood me or not, but I'm sure she was put up to it mm -hmm. because she looks, you know, well, of course she was Japanese and the perfect English, so I think she was taught to say that. But we went two or three times in, uh, into Japan mm -hmm. was uh, hauling different things. And from there, I think the last port was Guam that uh, we stopped, mm -hmm. stopped at. So. And then uh, you came back to the, headed back to the States? Uh, no, from, <laughs> from Guam we went back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Then from the Philippines we head back to Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And it was 31 days from the Philippines to Pearl Harbor in one shot. Wow. So our ship wasn't very fast. And then from Pearl Harbor, uh, we went to Astoria, Oregon. And the Astoria, Oregon is right at the mouth of the Columbia River. So our port of call, our, our Liberty Port would have been Portland, Oregon. So we went to a, a, a repair station there. Mm -hmm. and they made some repairs to the ship which was you know, common, every once in a while you pull into it and they make minor repairs, mm -hmm. and that's what we did there. So we stayed there for a couple of weeks at uh, Astoria, Oregon. Mm -hmm. That was a good Liberty port, so. And then you headed to, uh, we went to Terminal Island, which was, uh, I had enough points to come home, mm -hmm. but apparently uh, they had no use for the ship after that. So they decommissioned the ship. So, but, so from there, from uh, once they decommissioned the ship, I went back to, well, Boston, mm -hmm. Fargo building. But, but on the way back, we stopped in Chicago, and we had a, I think it was a six hour layover in Chicago. Of course, it, the, the Navy doesn't come up with the nicest schedules in the world, they could care less. So we had six hours, so they, they give us liberty. So we went into Chicago, and three of us, three or four of us, missed the ship, missed the train to Boston. Well, normally, you know, it, well, big, you'd be in big trouble, the tantamount of AOL. So when we got back to Boston, there was no words, I didn't care. But, oh, it must have been a year and a half after I got out of the service, I get a letter in the mail open, and there was the reimbursement for the money that I spent for my own fare to Boston. I couldn't believe it. Uncle Sam paid me back. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned uh, you were discharged from the Fargo building? Is yes, the yep. From the, yep, that's where I got my discharge. Mm -hmm. That was March, I forget what it was. 14th you had, uh, we had mentioned. Yeah, it would have been four, March 14th, uh, 45. Uh, 46. Was it 46? 46. 46, yeah, yeah, 46. Do you have any memories of that day? Oh, lots of, lot of best memory of my life. When, when I went from Boston, got to the old train station, Pittsfield, my brother was there. Well, I hadn't seen my brother for five years because he was in before I got in, and 
he'd come home after I got out. So he's waiting for me at the station. So both of us were young back when we got in. It didn't drink. So nowadays kids are 14 years old and drink it. We didn't drink. My brother never drank until he was 21. Anyway, he's walking up West Street. We look over to Busy B. You probably remember the Busy B. He said, Ho, call me Ho. Ho, you, you, how about having a beer? I said, Okay. So we stopped and had a beer, maybe two beers. Walk up the street. The next tavern we come to, we stopped, had a couple of beers. We all the way down North Street, all the way down Tyler Street, we stopped at every tavern and along the way. <laughs> By the time we got down to Tyler Street, we were pretty well, you know, negotiable, but, you know, not cold sober. So we come to this little soda fountain, and it's a soda fountain. My brother had a girlfriend, that, a lady friend that he had a crush on. So he said, come on, let's stop here. Said, okay. So, and we lived just around the corner from this place. So we stopped there, and she was sitting in a booth with another girl. So my brother naturally sat with her, and I sat with this other girl, and best thing ever happened in my life. I ended up marrying this young, young lady. Yeah, she was a was a, wow. well, probably two and a half years after that mm -hmm. that we got married. Wow, yeah. that's a nice. So story. I met my wife. And of course, that's a big family joke now. The <laughs> grandkids, oh, grandpa, grandpa was drunk when he met grandma. <laughs> but I wasn't that drunk. I knew I knew a pretty girl. You know what you were doing. You huh? got, <laughs> yeah. So how did you feel coming home at that time? Oh, good, good. Yeah, the war was over. We were out. But then, what do we do now? Of course, we had our own problem. My, my father had died before he went to service. My mother had tuberculosis, so she was in a sanitarium. And my oldest sister was taking care of the younger sister. So my brother and I, we didn't go to a, a lot of the guys were going to school under the GI Bill. Neither one of us went to school because we stayed home, took care of our, our, the family. Mm -hmm. And then the people who owned the house we were renting needed it for their own family because they had kids coming back. So we had to get out, so we had to buy a house. So things were, whew, weren't very good for a little while. Mm -hmm. But it was good to get back to see your old buddies, you know, and uh, yeah. get back to some real good hunting and fishing. So, Did you go to work right away or? Uh, not right away. They had what they called a uh, 5220 club. You could stay, you could get $20 bill every week for 52 weeks. That doesn't sound like much, but $20 80 years ago, or 65 years ago, was a, you know, yeah. a good chunk of change. Mm -hmm. So I collected for a while, and then finally went to General Electric, mm -hmm. worked, got a job there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is that what you did for a living? I mean, uh, you went in GE, did you stay there? Or? Yeah, st uh, careered out in, in General Electric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I started out as a machinist in high voltage bushings, and then went to machinist down to uh, OP3, which is a naval ordinance, and well, for about 14 years a machinist, and then I went to school. I went night school for seven years. I went to night schools, and ended up as a foreman, and then a manufacturing administrator for the Mark 73 gun directors mm -hmm. that they built an ordinance, and that's what I was doing when I retired mm -hmm. in uh, night. April Fool's Day. That was, oh, well, I'm working on my 20th year of retirement yeah, and enjoying every you. second of it. Good for you. Now, it was during this period that uh, you got called up uh, yeah, for the uh, Korean War. Wife and I were planning to get married. Money was tight, so I joined the reserves. You know, you get a little extra money. Mm -hmm. So, and then about once, you'd go to meeting every month. And then once a year, you'd go on a two-week cruise. And the two-week, one cruise was down in Guantanamo Bay. Another one was up to Quebec, up the St. Lawrence River. That was a good cruise. And, oh, things were going great until all of a sudden the Korean War come out. And I had a critical rate. So they wanted me. They got me. So I had to go back in. So, And that was in uh, September of 1950. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Well, you said you'd just gotten married. And, uh, just gotten married. Yeah. Uh, had to leave my, leave my poor wife, so she stayed with my, uh, her brother and sister while I was in. Mm -hmm. 
And where did you go? Where did you well, have to report to? We reported down to Boston. And when we reported to Boston, after all the ceremonies are getting in, and finally went to one table, and the guy in front of me, incidentally, was one of the guys I talked into joining the reserve. He's right in front of me, steps up to the desk, and, and the kid behind the, the counter there, he takes out the papers, and he gives him a big packet. And he says, uh, you're assigned to the USS Macaulay. And my friend says, well, where's that located? He said, uh, Seoul, Korea. Uh -huh. So I'm next. I step up in front of the guy, and the guy hands me a packet. And he says, you're assigned to the USS Glennon. And I held my breath. He goes, where's that assigned? He says, Newport, Rhode Island. I said, yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a thrill. That was so good. So I went, that, I, I took a bus down to Newport that mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. So that night, reported aboard the USS Glennon. I walk aboard ship, and it was, it was after chow, it was after supper. I walked aboard, and the guy that was on the quarter deck, he's logging me in, and he says, uh, he looks at the paper, he says, what's your name? I said, Homer. Oh, my God, he said, what a horrible name. He said, what's your middle name? I said, Lawrence. Okay, from now on, you're Larry. <laughs> and to this day, if I get a letter, Larry Willette, I know it's from one of the shipmates. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what were you assigned to uh, on, on board the Glennon? Well, when I, the first I got, when I first got aboard, this guy just happened to be a second or first, no, a third class radar man. And he looked at me, he says, oh, you're a second class radar man, huh? And I said, yeah. He said, that makes you leading petty officer. So I'm leading petty officer. I didn't know what that meant. So I go to sleep. The next morning I get up, and of course, uh, I'm assigned to CIC, which is a communications center, mm -hmm. combat information center. All the information aboard a ship, except a CW radio, it, de -de 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 -de, yeah. that communication doesn't come to us. Everything else did, sonar, the flags, uh, uh, all the radios, all the radar, everything comes to that, and we evaluate it, post it, and disseminate it throughout the ship where it's used. So I, I get up, I have breakfast, I go up in the CIC, and I walk in, I look around. I said, oh my God, I am in big trouble. Because on board the LSM, I had a radar that was about a big couple feet by one little radar with one little tube, and the purpose of it was to keep station. Of course, you're traveling in the darkness. You've got to keep the station when you're in a flotilla. Mm -hmm. So that was, the purpose of that was keep station and also to let the skipper know when we're 150 yards from the beach and to drop the hook. And that's about the size of my job. And for a uh just amuse yourself, you you'll know, plot other ships and stuff. So I walk into Combat Information Center aboard the Glennon, and here's about four different radars. And then there's a huge table, a plotting table, and a DRT table, and a big board up in the corner, the guy's staying behind, polar coordinate chart, that's where they log all the aircraft. So in the places just, radios are crackling, and finally some, one radio's ho hollering co uh, combat, combat, this is a uh, pay dirt, pay dirt, or not combat, uh, sunglass, this is pay dirt. That's, the kid's nudging me, he says, that's you, that's you. I said, who? He says, that's you. I said, no. I said, he said, that's our ship. I said, I thought this was a Glennon. No, that's our call sign. I said, what's a call sign? <laughs> so I said, geez, I, I'm a, he said, that's, that's the TBS, with the, the talk between ships radio going, see? So I said, well, you answer it, so he did. So I got all the guys together and I said, look, I knew I was in trouble. I, you know, I'm a second class writer. I'm, I'm supposed to know all this stuff. I don't know nothing. But fortunately, the Navy, everything is written down. You can find it anywhere. Every procedure is written down. And in the back of the squawk box, there was a little shelf. And the shelf had about 10 books lined up. And I told the guys, look, I says, you do whatever you've been doing, keep doing it. And I spent the next two weeks in a corner reading those books. And I read them and read them and read them. Finally, one day I said, okay, I'm going to take over. And I took over. And I did all right, apparently, because I, I ended up as first class. And when I left, they wanted to make me a chief. I said, no, no, thanks. <laughs> I said, I, if 
I have a wife that did not ask for a sailor for a husband, so I'm going home with my wife, and I did. <laughs> so what, uh, what type of uh, duty did you have aboard the Glennon? I mean, where did you go? And <laughs> oh, we went to the, from Newport, we went to the Mediterranean twice. One of them was a six-month cruise. That was, that was a long cruise. Uh, and we'd sail in the Mediterranean through, uh, well, we went to uh, Norfolk, and then, ironically enough, or interestingly enough, if you set your course due east out of Norfolk, and barring any set and drift in the ocean, you go right straight through the, rock, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar. Mm. We went in there, uh, Italy, different ports we'd stop at. A lot of the ports were courtesy ports, you know, just to show off the Navy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of them were to pick up things, but we did go up the Asian Sea and we went to Venice, and from Venice over to Yugoslavia. And we tied up alongside the USS Albany, and the Albany's a light cruiser. And <clears throat> the Albany was there to provide water and power to a small contingent of Navy guys that were stationed there. So we stayed there quite a while, but we'd sa sail up and down the coast, picking up radio frequencies in recording them and taping them and shipping them back to Washington, I guess. A lot of Russian radios, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not, not talk radio, but CW. Mm -hmm. So, and then let me see, we went back to Newport, down to Guantanamo. We were down Guantanamo, uh, well, that was for gunfire, and for uh, shore, uh, they'd send a crew ashore from the ship to direct the guns. And then as a gun go, would go off, I'd be on the radio and you'd count when the, you knew how far away they were mm -hmm. and you'd count and uh, you'd say the word salvo when you expect the sh shot to go off, say it was four seconds. You'd count time at four seconds and salvo. And the guy on shore, that shot going off, I knew it was from our ship. See, because theoretically other ships were firing at the same time. And they would send back where it hit. And the object was to shoot, shoot one shot over the target, one shot under the target, and the rest for effect, the rest on target. Mm -hmm. and we did that for quite a while. And then, well, back to Newport. Now Ooh. you brought your wife down, you mentioned, for a while. She yes, well, while the ship was in port between these cruises, uh, she came down and she went off. We got a little apartment and we stayed there in... I, well, of course, a lot of, I had a lot of duty on board ship, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was interesting, but of course she wasn't, you know, she was real young and, yeah. you know, it was tough on her, yeah. a lot tougher than me because I had people I knew. Yeah. She knew a few people from other guys aboard ship had wives there, so. Now you had one story uh, where you went home on leave and oh. about leaving the ship that morning. It was around Christmas time. I took a ship. I took, uh, the wife was home then, because we'd just come back from a cruise, so she was back home. So I, I got on a Liberty boat, a whale boat, went ashore, and there was a whole bunch of sailors there ready to go back to the ship, all my shipmates, and the shipmates of the USS Power, which was moored alongside of us. And I left, I come back home. I get home, about two days I'm home, and I pick up the newspaper. The newspaper said there's a Liberty, or a, Motor whale boat in Newport Island tipped over and 19 men were lost. And they were from the USS Glennon and the USS Power. Mm -hmm. And they were my shipmates. So in fact, one of them was the, my wife's, a good friend of my wife, he, she met her, it was the husband, or the wife of this guy. Mm -hmm. And they didn't find him for oh, months later at the mouth of the, uh, at the mouth of the harbor. But we lost all, some from the Glennon, some from the, mm -hmm. the, the power. Mm -hmm. And that, that, then they took, at that time, they used to moor all the ships out in the sea, out in the harbor. Now, if you went to Newport, when the ships would moor right along, right along the shore, mm -hmm. they weren't staying out in the thing. Yeah. So. Now, you went on another cruise. Uh, you said uh, when you got back from Gitmo, they 
took all the warm weather gear off. And you know, we got the Wonderful. new port, took all our warm weather, and here comes all this foul weather gear. We said, oh, we didn't know what was up, but we knew it was going to be north. So we got on board ship, got all loaded, off we went, and the orders were to just head north. And we headed north, crossed the Arctic Circle, and this is on, of course, the east coast. Went up, kept going. I don't know how far we got up north, but it was nasty. The oh, waves, and coal, and in the Navy, they're loading stores, loading ammunition, and chipping ice. Everybody participates. Even the officers off watch participate. And you'd strap yourself, tie yourself to a railing or something, and get a little hammer and chip the ice off because it'd be forming so fast. Mm -hmm. and the reason for that is they say that if there was six to eight inches of ice forming on all the rigging, is enough weight to raise the center of gravity high enough so the ship could turn right upside down. Mm -hmm. So we'd be out there chipping ice all the time. And <clears throat> every morning, I'd be on the uh, talk between ship the radio, and all the inf like I said, all the information comes to combat, and the, and the ships are reporting in. And one ship had lost the lifeboat, another ship the railing, and the K-gun, some of the depth charges broke loose and rolled, and all kinds of disasters yeah. going on from, yeah. from the ships. And then all of a sudden, somebody, some ship reported on board their ship as a destroyer, they, some kid had appendicitis in the head. <laughs> they didn't know quite what to do. So what they did is we, had, we were with the, the CV-42, which is the FDR carrier. Mm -hmm. Not the Teddy Roosevelt carrier, but it was the FDR, the yeah. Franklin Roosevelt. And of course, it's so big that the destroyer got right up alongside of it when it was, a, and it sailed along to, on a nice smooth surface because of the FDR was kind of smoothing out the sea for him. And they managed to get the kid on board the FDR, fortunately, and apparently they operated on him then. But mm -hmm. I, got, I always felt sorry for the, well, the crew and the kid mm -hmm. both. Um, so, so what? Uh, why did you think you had to go north like that? What, what was your... There was some thought that the, the gearing class, that was a class we are, our destroyers is the gearing class, that that class of destroyers would have been better off in the Pacific because they weren't meant for the Atlantic because of, because of the conditions. The, the Atlantic is a lot rougher than the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Not to say the Pacific can't get rough, but normally it isn't, it isn't as rough. So uh, they just wanted to see how much punishment they could take. So apparently they never did change anything because we just stay, most of them stay right in the, in the Atlantic, the destroyers. So then you come back to uh, Newport. Uh, after that. that, we come back to Newport and they got rid of us fall weather gear, thank the Lord for that. In the next cruise, we went to England. And uh, the purpose of that Crews was, of course, destroyers are, other than sh the shore power, you know, uh, most of the service of d destroyers are, is anti-submarine warfare, a lot of it. We, you know, guarding convoys. And so what, we, what, what the purpose of it was, was to teach the American Navy how to pass a sub-contact. In other words, we pick up contact of submarine mm -hmm. and you want to hand it to the British. How, how can you hand it to the British so they can pick it up? And it, it isn't as easy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. But that was the whole purpose of the thing. So we went to Scotland. No, it wasn't Scotland. It was London, Darien, Ireland. We went up there. That, and our ship was there. And we would go out into the North Sea and play these war games. Mm -hmm. well, it, 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 after we learned how to do it, they test your knowledge. So out we went. And they actually had submarines. And we played games with the submarines, chased them around. And of course, I mentioned CIC has this big table. And under the table, there's a mechanism that shines a little light up. And that's where your ship is. And it's all timed to the screws. And that little light will move just the same speed we're moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So you keep plotting. And then you plot the sonar contacts from there where the submarine and you put times on them all. And all, all of that data from all the ships were sent to one location. And something that I, 
U.S. Navy's never done that they should do, I think. The British did. They got the crews in the room, and on the wall of that room was a huge, huge map. And it was a map of the sea right there, around there. And they had all those charts marked on that wall. And the skippers, each skipper would get up. And they had, a, they had all the skippers standing there. And one of them would say, well, at such and such a time, he would, was right here. And then the sub commander, he'd mention where he was. And the sub that we were chasing, the submarine commander, he said what he did was made a very, very quick turn. When he makes a quick turn in the submarine, it forms what they call a knuckle. It churns the water up with en enough density that the sonar will actually ping off of that mm -hmm. chunk of water. This was way back now, now nowadays. It's a lot different to sonars. But it would ping off that, and that little bubble of water would kind of float off, and it'd be pinging on that. Meanwhile, the submarine, he'd take a quick turn and then scoot off this direction. We're following this. So the submarine captain won. <laughs> so it was very interesting to see it done and what's mm -hmm. going on, other than just, you know, unknown. Yeah. It was interesting. Now, I, I can't remember if you said it was before that or not, but uh, you went through uh, Buzzard Canal up into Boston one time? Yes. Uh, they, they, they were taking these gearing class uh, destroyers and putting new masts on them. The mast we had was just one big pole, and, we put, and they put a tripod mast on. So we went from Newport through the Buzzard Bay Canal up into Boston Harbor, and we went into dry dock. And the dry dock there was just, oh, maybe with walking distance of the USS Constellation, the old Ironsides. Mm -hmm. And we were there for quite a while. So I got a little apartment on right near the Bunker Hill, believe it or not, because out the bedroom window you could see Bunker Hill Monument. And we were there for a good three months. Of course, what the Navy does with guys then, they send you to school. The Fargo Billings loaded with schools. Mm -hmm. So of course they sent me to radar school. And when they put the mast on, it, it's tr Navy tradition that under the mast of a ship is a coin. And when they lowered the mast, just before they lowered the mast, the captain had a silver dollar and he stuck it under there and they lowered it on, welled it right on there. So it, yeah. it, it's just a, you know, an interesting fact about mm -hmm. it. Now coming well, back uh, from England, uh, you mentioned the story uh, at Nova Scotia. You were going oh, into yeah. Nova Scotia. When we come back from uh, Nova Scotia, Halifax, Nova Scotia, we were supposed to pull in there as a port of call, uh, kind of a, uh, they invited us to come in. And they had all kinds of parties they were going to have and all kinds of things, uh, events. Well, it just so happened before we got there, about two days before we got there, the King of England died. I don't know if you remember that. And so they radioed back that we were invited to come to port come in, but a lot of the events had to be canceled. Mm -hmm. So we did, we went in, in, we were on a better behavior than we would have been if, with all those parties going on. But. And then you went back but, to Newport, uh, and you had the story about birth M18. Uh. Oh, we pulled into, pull into Newport, up Beaver, Beaver Tail and up through the, into the bay. And at that, in these mics, what they call Mike 18, is oh, probably as big as a stu studio, a big, big floating tub like. And the ships would moor right alongside of it. And ours was Mike 18. Well, Mike 18 just so happened to be the one we were mo moored at when the accident happened. So the skipper asked me to, you know, get a berthing assignment. So I, I talked to the base there and asked for a berthing assignment. And they told us that we would long moor port side of the USS Power at Mike 18, and I told that to the skipper. Skipper says, tell him, no, absolutely not. Because sailors are notoriously stupid, uh, superstitious. Mm -hmm. So they signed us to another port because he wouldn't. But it was funny, we were at one, when we were up that time, we were uh, moored there, and it was Thanksgiving, and my wife came to board ship brought us board ship in to have Thanksgiving dinner. So it was my wife and another guy's wife. So they're having 
you know, and the poor wife never been aboard ship, and the ship is just as calm, but it's rise on by. She says, it's moving, it's moving. <laughs> but anyway, after the, we were having a meal, right after the meal, all of a sudden, the weather started picking up, and they set condition, I forget what the number that the conditions were, but this was set condition two, and it's single up all lines. Well, when you moor, you moor with many lines out, and they take all the lines in, but two of them holding the ship there. Mm -hmm. And then condition two, that's condition three. Condition two is you start the engines. Condition one is you let go of them lines and off you go to sea because there's a storm coming. Well, they set condition two, the engines start. So he's like, <coughs> I went up and I told the captain, I said, you realize there's two women aboard? Oh, he said, I didn't know that. He said, oh, he said, unfortunately, the, the base commander I've, he you know, big stripes all over his arm. He was on board, and he had his motor whale boat, a real fancy thing. He said, well, he said, I'll get the base commander to take the two women back to shore. He said, you might as well go along with them. So I said, what happens if the ship takes off? He said, stay ashore. So we went back into, so it was an experience for the wife. She mm -hmm. came that close to going to sea with the U.S. <laughs> Navy. Navy. Yeah. So shortly after that, you were released... Uh from the service at that time? Yes, I went back, uh, got discharged, then back home, and then a couple of weeks later, I get a letter in the mail that I had to report to the uh, Navy training station on Hebert Road, it's up near Pontusic Lake, it was a Navy training station, mm -hmm. in the reserve station where right. it was. So I went up there, and a guy up there, he, gives me some papers. He says, you've got to sign these papers you, or you, uh, because the records will be, you know, they won't be complete without these papers signed. So I took the papers and I looked at them. I said, I'm not going to sign these. He said, why not? I said, they're reenlistment papers. And what they were, and he said, and then he said, no, they, they're backdated. And they were. And he said, uh, uh, they, they never got into your record. They, they lost him somewhere along the line. And yeah. Then I told him how I, you know, then he realized I had been in for those couple of years. He said, you know something? He says, if you'd have known about this, you could have walked off the ship any time because they had no record you even belonged there. <laughs> uh, Strange things happen. So do you think the military had a positive or negative effect on your life? Oh, very positive. That one I told you about in boot camp, when I, I, I could now look at a man, I don't have to look at his clothes, you know. Mm -hmm. What he's wearing doesn't mean nothing, you know. It can be fancy suits, and he's still a guy, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that, and plus, when I went in, I was very shy. Uh, and being in the Navy really changed me. Mm -hmm. And then being in control of those guys, you know, well, 15 radar men. And then I ended up on board ship, not only had the CIC, but I had all O division. That was all the radio men or sonar men, radar men, the quartermasters on the bridge. Anybody who was above, anybody had control of the ship, mm -hmm. not the black gang, which was the uh, guys that take care of the engines. I had all those guys. There was 60 of those. So that gave me some leadership. And of course, when I got over to General Electric, I ended up in a foreman. That helped in that position. Mm -hmm. So definitely, definitely helped. Mm -hmm. I think every kid should go into service, really. It really makes a man out of a boy. So, mm -hmm. gives them, ch changes their perspectives and teaches them a lot. Mm -hmm. And one nice thing about being in the Navy, though, you always felt healthy because there's always doctors checking you out. No matter what happens, there's a doctor checking you constantly. So you always felt good about that. So, yeah. Yeah. well, I know you have some pictures and some other memorabilia that uh, you would like to show and talk about. So let's do that now. Mm -hmm. Fine. All right. Okay, well, why don't we uh, explain some of the pictures here that you have. All right, here's a picture of me right after boot camp, believe it or not. Geez, I didn't look like a boot. I looked like a real sailor there. <laughs> now, this next picture, that's the Cavalier Hotel. And that was right on the beach. That was, that was real good duty, good food. And here's a picture of our LSM. Uh, Big bow doors, the ramp drops down. This is the conning tower. Well, here you can see the conning tower. 
And those are the little portholes. Skipper stayed up there. In this right here is the uh, radar. In f I'll tell you a story about that radar. It's covered over with a plastic tub, and we had to paint it one time, and one of the guys went up and painted it with lead-based paint. Well, a radar wave don't go through lead-based paint, so we had to scrape it and do it all over again. <laughs> and what's the patch uh, there? What well, this patch that? here is amphibians. Any guy that was in the amphibians wore this patch on his left arm, and uh, it just signified that you were in the amphibians, mm -hmm. what they call the Gator Navy. The Gator being, our symbol was a bow, the uh, bow doors are open, a ramp is, it was a, an alligator with its mouth open, tanks mm -hmm. coming out. Mm -hmm. But this signified that. <coughs> Here is a, this is when the ship, I was telling you about the ship being high and dry. This is when it was high and dry, and part of the crew members standing there, and we scraped all the barnacles off the ship at that time. Mm -hmm. This shot right here is when we, uh, uh, when we were loading tanks, the Second Marine Division. We were loading tanks uh, for the invasion of Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And these, uh, and this. Now this is looking into the tank well. See, there's no cover on this tank well. An LST would have a much higher with a cover on it, with a deck over the top. So there was one of the machine guns there, and there was a gun here, and it was, all spotted all through it, there was a, a different caliber guns. Now here's the LSM and uh, I don't, oh, some of the trucks. You can almost, you can make out some of the trucks that we had. Which, which uh, trip that was, I don't know, because they, they, they're all mixed up together now. Mm -hmm. But they had a little cover on top of the, for the keep out of the hot sun. This is looking forward because the, uh, the conning tower is on the starboard side. All right now, our story about that plate up there. What? What's <laughs> that story? <laughs> uh, I can tell this story because it's been 65 years ago, and I think the. Uh, uh, I don't think they can get me on this one. But we were coming back when when we pulled into Terminal Isle, Terminal Island. Uh, I was on a quarter deck watch one night, and it was I had the 12 to 4, so. All of a sudden, it came to, I, I spotted it that afternoon. I had a plan. So I told my the, the runner, it, when you're on a quarter deck watch, you have a runner. He'll you know, run the errands. So I told him, I said, go down to the machine shop and get a hammer and chisel. So he went down and got the hammer and chisel. And I went and I chiseled this off the bulkhead. Well, this is the, the put on there, I guess, the day of the commissioning. So I took it and I brought it and I had a suitcase. I slid it in the the lining of the suitcase, because I knew the skipper would be looking for it, and sure enough, he found it missing. He, he wanted it himself. Now, I don't know if you notice the dates, but if you, little mathematics, I say, uh, that ship was built in 41 days. That's mm. all it took to build that ship. See, well, they always have the keel laid, and when it was uh, launched, and when it was commissioned. Then when I got on the, during the Korean War, on a destroyer, I said, there's a plaque like this on a destroyer. So I went down, I was going to get that one. The thing was as big as this picture, big solid brass and really bolted the bulk. I couldn't get that one. So but then you... That, that's a, the story of that. And that's been hanging in my den all these years. That's so, a good story. Yeah. So then you so, went to the Korean War and, and uh, on the Glennon. Uh, yeah, here's the Glennon right here. And now, you see, uh, that's me just squatted next to the Glennon. I forget what port we were in. We were there, but... Uh, here's a, here's a, the Glennon pic, broadside picture of it. And this was the captain, and this was the executive officer. And almost all the time, you have a good captain and a tough executive officer, or the other way around. I think it's planned that way. Well, this guy was really tough. He was really tough, but he was good. I often said if you had to go to war, that's the guy to go to war with because he knew his business. But he was, this guy was easy. So I think the Navy plans it that way. And then this is you out on the this is high me. seas? Yeah, this is me on the, right outside the uh, CIC. There is, it's right up in here somewhere, right up on a deck. We're standing just cruising along. 
It's mm. uh, <clears throat> in this picture here, that's myself and my brother-in-law who was in Korea. Uh, he's gone now. He, he also fished around the bend. Mm -hmm. And that, so, uh, the carrier you were uh, refueling, is that what you said? The oh, here it is. This, yeah, this is the, uh, the CV-42, which was the Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And apparently they're, they're probably going to fuel mm -hmm. because we fuel from the carrier, or, or we fuel the carrier, or, or pass guys by High Line. Mm -hmm. So oh, we've uh, had that one there. Yeah, yep. and then we were going to look at your ribbons and medals. Okay, I, I, there's one missing here because one of the one of the one of the medals was from a, the government, and it it is not here, but. Uh, those, those the little stars are the battles. The, the, some of them are campaign ribbons. This one is, uh, this one here was from the government of Korea. This one was from the government of the Philippines. Of course, that's U.S. But here's first class. This it denotes it. You have uh, one hitch in the service. For every hitch you get, you know, hitches. I don't know, four years. Four I years. think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see the little. Like a, uh, this is we used to show up on your radar screen, so that's about this. Oh, my dog! These are my original dog. This one is a, my original dog tag from World War II. These dog tags come from the Korean War. Mm -hmm. So that was given to me by the GE before I went to serve. It was with a Navy E award oh. because at the time we were making mortar shell, mortar fuse tips for the for uh, the army. So that's about the size of it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your experiences, and thank you so much for your sacrifices and courage for the service you gave to your country. We well, really appreciate it, Hal. Okay. Well, thank you very much for asking. Uh,